It is our customary procedure to spend the next few moments in silent prayer, giving each of you the opportunity to rebound if necessary. If we name our sins to God, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of assembling ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the things we note. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Galatians 4.30. Galatians 4.30. We went over some of this yesterday but we need to go over it again because there's some more information I need to give you concerning this. Galatians 4.30 Now in Galatians 4.30 and 4.31 this ends the allegory. And if you weren't here for the allegory you'll have to listen on the internet or I'll have to make a CD for you because the allegory was something that made me stand up and cheer the other night. And I've been studying harder than ever, but I still can't seem to get ahead in terms of the number of lessons, but it's all right. The quality of the messages will be better. So Galatians 4.30 Nevertheless, what does the Scripture say? Separate yourself from the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman will not share the inheritance with the son of the free woman. We noted what that was all about in the allegory. Now legalism and grace cannot coexist, therefore you should separate yourself from legalism. You should separate yourself from legalistic churches. And if you're now a grace believer, you must separate yourself from a legalistic church. You can't have one foot in legalism and another foot in grace is what it's saying. But this is not the point we're going to study today because we studied that point yesterday. And I hammered it home yesterday. So today we're studying something else. The last part of it. For the son of the slave woman will not share the inheritance with the son of the free woman. Now what does that mean? That means there is no inheritance for the legalist. There's no inheritance in heaven for the legalist. There is no escrow blessings in time. Neither is there escrow blessings in eternity for the legalist. For those who think that salvation is by works, or for those who think that spirituality is by works, there is no inheritance. There is no eternal rewards. And of course we receive eternal rewards when we execute this unique spiritual life. I don't know if I have that slide up here concerning rewards. If I don't, I'll have to get it later. I don't think I do. And I don't, but what we'll look at is this instead. These are the four spiritual mechanics which we've noted on several occasions with a bug going across it. So the four spiritual mechanics. This is what we've noted many, many times. If you've been with us, you've about probably memorized all of this. Now there's no inheritance for the legalist. Why? The reason why is because the legalist doesn't use the filling of the Spirit. And as we see... Utilization of the two power options. What is that? The filling of God the Holy Spirit. How do you receive the filling of God the Holy Spirit? You name your sins to God and then you're filled with God the Holy Spirit. So you must use the two power options. Filling of the Holy Spirit plus Operation Z. Operation Z is when you learn from the your right pastor Bible doctrine. And that will equal the development of the problem solving devices. And so what legalists do is they go astray. As we will note, they go adrift from grace. They go adrift from grace. Therefore, they go adrift from the filling of the Spirit. They go adrift from Operation Z. And they do not function under these spiritual matters. They do not have the three spiritual skills. What are the three spiritual skills? Are they stop doing this and that? No. The three spiritual skills are the filling of the Holy Spirit plus Operation Z 
the Bible teacher teaching you doctrine, plus the problem-solving devices. The problem-solving devices we've studied in detail, 1 through 10. And then you can move to the adult stages, the three adult stages of the spiritual life. And this is where you receive the blessing for both time and eternity. But you don't receive this blessing when you go into legalism. So guess what? Do you go into legalism? No inheritance. Do you believe in Christ as so many people have? And that's a wonderful thing. Many people in this country and especially in this area have believed in Christ and I'm glad for them because they're not going to have to spend eternity in the lake of fire. But as soon as they've believed in Christ, they've topped right over into legalism. And they've decided to put stipulations, human taboos, the works of the law on people, and by doing and also imposing the works of the law on themselves. And by doing so, they've completely ignored the filling of the Spirit. And they don't know how to be filled with the Spirit. And they think that their Christian way of life has to do with following a set of taboos. Don't do this, don't do that. You better do this, you better do that, and you better do the other. And this is not what the spiritual life is about. The spirit, how are you spiritual? Ask yourself this question. What makes you spiritual? The filling of God the Holy Spirit. That's what make, makes you spiritual. So there's no inheritance for the legalist, and that's what it's saying in Galatians 4.30. Now, if you've believed in Christ, and then you go in for legalism, as most people have in this area and across the country, then you will get to heaven. And if the resurrection were to occur tonight at 9 o'clock, we'd all go to heaven along with most of these legalists around this area. And therefore, they will receive a resurrection body, but they will not receive an inheritance. That means they will not get to rule in the millennium. All of this we've noted in the past. Now in Galatians 4.31. Now in conclusion, royal family. Royal family includes everyone who's believed in Christ. Now in conclusion, royal family, we are not the children of the slave woman, but of the free. We are the children of the freed woman, meaning what? We're freed from the law. We're freed from taboos. And we are now able to live the unique spiritual life. So now in conclusion, royal family, we are not children of the slave woman. So why go back to the Mosaic law? Why go back to observing the Sabbath? Why go back to observing certain taboos? Now you're free. You're free. You've believed in Christ. You're saved. And now you can live your spiritual life and be filled with the Spirit and utilize these wonderful things we've been studying over the past 450 hours. I'm approaching 500 hours now of Bible study. And that just in a few years. Actually less than a few years. So in conclusion, royal family, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free. So now in Galatians 5.1, we get to see the freedom of the believer. When you believe in Jesus Christ, you receive freedom. You're free. Spiritually free. Now we have soldiers fighting for our freedom in terms of our human freedom, and that's important. But as much as we admire and adore our human freedom, our spiritual freedom is even greater. Yet so many people don't even know they have a spiritual freedom. So Galatians 5.1 For freedom, Christ has set us free. For freedom, Christ has set us free. So what does it mean to be free in terms of spirituality? Well, first of all, when you believe in Christ, you are free from Adam's original sin. When you believe in Christ, you're free from Adam's original sin. Secondly, we are free and have the means to live apart from the power of the old sin nature. No longer do you have to be enslaved to the old sin nature. You can be free apart from the old sin nature. And how do you do that? You see, if you're not filled with the Spirit, you're going to constantly be in sin. You're going to constantly sin. If you don't have the filling of the Spirit, you're going to sin. They're at battle with each other. 
There's a war going on in your soul. What do you have in your body? When you were born, you were born with the old sin nature. In fact, Adam's original sin was imputed to you. When you believed in Christ, the penalty of Adam's original sin was removed, but still inside of you is the old sin nature. And so how do you become free from the old sin nature? 1 John 1, 9. Name your sins to God, and therefore you will be freed from that, and you will have the filling of God the Holy Spirit. If we name our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. And when He purifies us from all wrongdoing, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit, and at that point we live apart from the old sin nature. And there's a battle raging in our very own bodies. Now in eternity, we will be totally free from sin. You see, on this earth, we're going to sin. We're going to sin till the time we breathe our last breath. But in eternity, we will never sin again. And that's a wonderful thing to look forward to. In eternity, you'll never sin again. Never ever will you sin in eternity. What a wonderful thing to look forward to because sin is the source of a lot of problems in your life. Your very own sins. Most of the problems you have in your life are self-induced. They are problems you bring upon yourself. And God Himself doesn't even have to punish you because you punish yourself under your own sin nature. Now, if you get way out of line, God the Father will also add on to that punishment, especially where other people are involved and you try to judge someone else or make fun of someone else or run someone else into the ground and especially run a pastor no matter how good he is or how bad he is you try to run a pastor into the ground uh, sex tuplet compound discipline you just don't do it so in eternity we will be totally free from sin and legalism is never the basis for freedom legalism is never the basis for freedom what does legalism do? It puts upon you certain laws. Now, why do people tell us that we can't do something on Sunday? Why do people tell us that we can't work on Sunday? Or that we can't play on Sunday? Or that we can't do this or that on Sunday? They're still in bondage to the law. They're still in bondage to the Mosaic Law. And by the way, it was Saturday that it was really given to, but Christians have decided to turn it into Sunday because that's our day of worship, but every day should be a day of worship. So God has provided for us Christ dying as a substitute for us. So we're saved by grace, therefore we should live by grace. Did you do anything for your salvation? Think about it. If you have done something for your salvation, you might need to think, maybe I'm not saved. You don't do anything to impress God. What impressed God? The work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And if you understand that the work of Jesus Christ is what saved you, then you understand faith alone in Christ alone. Then you're saved. But if you add anything to it, what does Romans say? It says you go into debt. You become a debtor. You've been saved by faith alone in Christ alone. And if you do not believe that, if you do not believe that the only thing you have to do is believe in Christ, then you do not believe that Christ did enough and you're in blasphemy. Christ definitely did enough for you on the cross. And if you believe otherwise, if you believe you can lose your salvation, you are so arrogant, you are so full of yourself, it is unimaginable. And maybe you're not even saved. Maybe you are. Maybe you believed at one point and had faith alone in Christ alone and then later began to believe these silly things. But unless you've had faith alone in Christ alone, you're bound for hell. Because we cannot add to the work of Christ on the cross by our behavior. Now, sometimes there needs to be a behavior change once we believe in Christ. And sometimes we need to, uh, all the time, we need to be filled with the Spirit. And we need to do these things to change maybe a lifestyle that we had in carnality. But the fact is, we cannot add to the work of Christ on the cross. So liberty, for freedom, Christ has made us free. That's liberty. Now we have the corrected translation, continuing. Make a permanent stand on a principle of liberty. That's how it comes out. Or keep on, linear action, sorry. Keep on making a permanent stand on the principle of liberty. This is also dative of advantage in the Greek. 
David, David, above, adva- uh, David, David above advantage means that you are free for your advantage. So liberty is a method by which you live your life. And if you live your life by grace, then you live your life in the sphere of liberty and freedom. If you live under legalism, you live under slavery. You live under slavery to the law and to taboos. And you live under slavery even while you live. Then it continues, in which Christ has once and for all set us free. Now we did not help Christ in setting us free. We did not help Christ by raising our hands. We did not help Christ by coming forward. We did not help Christ by weeping tears of repentance. We did not help Christ by having an emotional spirit experience. Now how do you get to know people and how did you get to know Christ? This is something you need to ask yourself in order to bring it down to reality. Because some people go way outside of reality when they think about salvation. They go way outside of reality. And they think that I had an emotional experience, therefore I'm saved. I spoke in tongues, therefore I'm saved. I did this, that, and the other, therefore I'm saved. And they go outside of reality in thinking this. And so the fact is, the only way of salvation is faith alone in Christ alone, of course. And what we need to ask ourselves is this. You can't provide yourself a resurrection body, can you? You can't design it and make it look all pretty the way you want it to. You see, everybody takes phase one. Phase one is salvation. And this is what's funny about legalism, and it's what kind of puts a nail in it. We have phase one. Now in phase one, that's salvation. And that is, how are you saved? Faith alone and Christ alone. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. God loved the world so much that He gave His uniquely born Son so that whosoever believes in Him shall have eternal life. It's faith alone and Christ alone. Phase two is spirituality. And then phase three is eternity. Now I'm going to ask you something that this is what people do. Now look, in phase one salvation, what do people say? They say you've got to add to it. They say you've got to repent. You've got to feel sorry for your sins. You've got to do this, that, and the other. You've got to add to it. While the Bible has always told us Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And we went over those passages so many times that it's almost redundant but necessary to repeat. So that's phase one. And we know how we're saved. Faith alone in Christ alone. Now phase two. The legalists come along and said, Now in phase two, in order to be spiritual, you must be circumcised. In order to be spiritual, you must give up this and that. Or you must do this and that. But where are they in phase three? Nowhere. And why not? Because then they would be saying that they could create by their own works a resurrection body. So they don't even mess with this. They don't mess with eternity because they can't. And they don't even get close to it. And you might not understand what I'm saying, but uh, just think of the Sims game. You know, you like to make yourself into a person or you like to... uh, The Sims game on the computer, you can uh, create people. You might create me with my big belly, etc. But guess what? Uh, Have you ever thought about creating yourself as you will look in eternity? No! You don't even think that way. You don't even think about creating the white robe that you'll wear, etc. And why not? Because you can't do it! You You can't make your resurrection body no matter what you do. Even legalists will acknowledge that. If you get up to a legalist and they've been arguing with you, the only thing you say is, well, tell me how to make my resurrection body pretty. If you can save yourself and if you can uh, be spiritual by what you do, then uh, tell me how you're going to make your resurrection body prettier as well. And one time when one of my relatives died, he even alluded to that because this relative, he was really interested in money. And he said he's probably in heaven now trying to change out crowns. 
and it tried to make a deal with the crown, you see, on his on his body. But you can't do it in the phase three, and if you can't do it in phase three, eternity, you can't do it in phase two, living the spiritual life, and you can't do it in phase one. So liberty is a method by which you live your life. Now we did not help Christ in making us free. Who made us free? Read in the Galatians 5.1 For freedom Christ has made us free. Who made us free? Christ made us free. So we did not help Christ in making us free. We didn't help Christ in making us free by raising our hands, by coming forward, by weeping at the altar, by having an emotional experience. So again, how do you get to know people? How do you get to know Christ? I'm going to bring it to you in some very logical terms and very basic terms because I know some of your backgrounds and your backgrounds have been kind of goofy. It's not your fault. It's just the way you were raised. Now it's your fault if you don't get out of it. If you decide to stay there, well, that's your fault. But if you decide to get out of it, well, good for you and welcome to the club. So how do you get to know people? Do you get to know people by raising your hands? Do you get to know people by walking forward to an altar? Do you get to know people by weeping? Do you get to know people by having an emotional experience? No. How do you get to know people? You get to know people by what they say. And when a person talks, it reveals a lot about themselves. And when a person talks in terms of rebellion, you know that's a rebellious person. And when a person talks in terms of humility, you know that might be a good friend to hang around. So how do you know the Lord? It's the same way. How do you get to know people? You learn what they say. How do you get to know the Lord? You learn what He has to say. And what does our Lord have to say? The Bible. Everything written in here is from Jesus Christ. And they make some parts of it red. That's what he said while he was in hypostatic union. But everything in here is what he has said from, he, from the beginning. Jesus Christ, as it were, wrote Genesis. Of course, Moses did, but Jesus Christ was the one who directed him. Jesus Christ wrote this whole thing. And in fact, if you want to think of it this way, the whole Bible should be in red. So what I'm telling you is, how do you get to know Christ? Get to know the Bible. Do you ever, when you get to meet somebody, do you ever raise your hand to try to get to know them? Do you ever try to speak in tongues to try to get to know them? No. Why? Because they'll look at you like you're crazy. And you would be. And so, how in the world can you get to know Christ in that same manner? Do you think Christ is impressed by the fact that you raise your hand? Do you think Christ is impressed by the fact that you can walk forward? Do you think Christ is impressed because the tear ducts in your eye can produce tears, the very eyes He created for you? No, He's not impressed with that. So you believe in Christ, and that is where you have your relationship with Christ. And after you believe in Christ and become a Christian, how do you have that relationship? You get to know Him, just as you get to know everyone else. You see, the problem with Christians in marriage today is they get married before they know the person they marry. They just get married because, well, everyone else is getting married. They need to hurry up and get married themselves. But you've got to know the person. And if you don't know the person, well, no wonder there's so much divorce. And part of it has to do with our spirit. Actually, all of it has to do with our spiritual lives. It has to do with our attitude toward Christ. And our attitude toward Christ has not been to get to know Christ. It's been to try to please Him through our human activity. And when you try to please Christ through human activity, you'll try to please people through human activity, and it's not going to work. And that's why divorce is up to about 60% among Christians. It's sad, but it's very true. So we did not help Christ in making us free. And the only way we can get to know Christ is by knowing Him. Now let's look at Romans 10.4. Romans 10.4. Just as part of this, it's a very short sentence, but it's very important, and we went over it before, but it's very important because it tells us that we're no longer under the law. 
And not only are we no longer under the law, we're no longer under taboos. We don't really follow the law today in terms of the legalists around here today. They follow parts of the law and then add a whole bunch of taboos to it. If they really followed the law, well, they would be acting nuts. But they act nuts anyway. Romans 10.4 Christ is the end of the law for all who believe. Have you believed in Christ? If you have believed in Christ, then that should be the end of the law for you. You should not go back to the law. You should not go back to the Sabbath. You should not go back to special days, special seasons, special years as we've studied earlier. So Christ is the end of the law who all, for all who do what? Believe. If you believed in Christ, stop going back to the law. Stop enslaving yourself. Galatians 5.18 is part of a preview of coming attractions. I hope you held your place in Galatians because that's what we're studying. And Galatians 5.18 is part of a uh, preview of coming attractions. If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The yoke of bondage is therefore any form of legalism. Now Galatians 5.18, if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. And what does that mean? That means if you're living the spiritual life, you're not under the law. Why do you keep trying to follow the law when you're under the Spirit? Man, I really wish some of my relatives could be here today. They might, run, they might have run out of here by now, though, I'm, to be serious with you. They might have been cursing me by now, just like the law has cursed them. I'm not bitter, though. Not really. I just wish they'd get with it. Galatians 5.18 If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So the yoke of bondage is what? It's any form of legalism. And there are millions of Christians in this country today and they are enslaved to a system of taboos and they are no benefit to them whatsoever. And then they try to force them ta those taboos on others and they're not a benefit to you either. Now in Galatians 5.2. Galatians 5.2. The Apostle Paul starts out with one word, listen. Listen. Then he goes on and says, I, Paul, tell you over and over, it means he repeats himself. The Apostle Paul repeated himself to their advantage. Now, first of all, he says, listen, and then he says, I tell you over and over again, and if you've been with me through all of Galatians, you know that a lot of times Paul has been repeating himself. And as a result, I've had to repeat myself because Paul's been doing it. But there's a reason behind it. Paul repeats, and Paul repeats for a specific reason. It is very rare that you ever find anyone who can concentrate on an hour of a message. Very rare that you can find anyone who can concentrate for a full hour. Most people's concentration level lasts about 20 minutes and then they fade away and then they come back. And that's normal. Don't feel bad if you're in that case. You're normal. It happens with all of us. It, except for me, I have to concentrate for an hour just to talk. And if I start flubbing my words up, I lost some concentration. But it, it's very difficult for, and it's a something that you train for. That is, you continuously learn and listen, listen and learn, listen and learn, and then eventually you develop an ability to listen for a full hour. Now they do have classes in school that last, what, 50 minutes? And then some classes even last longer if you only have them twice a week, right? At least that's the way it goes in college. And some classes in college went an hour and 20 minutes but some of the professors never could make it that long and we always got out early. Always. <laughs> they were lazy. But most people cannot concentrate for an hour. And that's why Paul repeats and that's why I repeat. And you say, why do you repeat these things? Because when I'm repeating, you may have heard them, but someone else may have been daydreaming. And then while you're daydreaming, maybe somebody else heard it. See, and repetition is very good for all of us because that's what cements it in our soul. So repetition is necessary. 
And it's something that you've probably learned as parents. Do you know if you tell your children to do something, oftentimes it takes more than once to tell them to do it? Do you know why? They're not listening. Sometimes it might take you two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times to tell them to do something before they even hear you. And then you'll say, Did you not hear me when I said do this? And they'll say, No, I didn't hear you. And they're not lying to you. You might think they are, but the fact is they have broken concentration. Sometimes they may lie, but oftentimes it's just broken concentration. Just like you have broken concentration in Bible class. And it's understandable. Because, in fact, it doesn't seem we're designed for this, but God the Holy Spirit. You see, when the disciples were praying for our Lord, as they should have been, they couldn't do it for an hour, not even one hour. What happened? They all fell asleep. And what did our Lord do? He looked at them and He said, Well, the Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So in terms of you concentrating for one hour, your spirit may be willing, you may be positive, but your flesh is weak. And all of us have that problem that must be overcome, but it takes dedication in terms of your dedication to learning the Word of God. So listen, I, Paul, tell you over and over, repeat, that if... Now this if in the Greek is a third class condition. And the third class class condition in the Greek means if and you can't. That if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no benefit to you at all. So what Paul is saying is you're not saved by circumcision, you're not spiritual by circumcision, and to us that seems obvious. Circumcising yourself means nothing to God. But I'll tell you what else means nothing to God in a moment. But you're not saved by circumcision. And that is obvious. But this verse includes any principle of legalism. You are not saved by any principle of legalism, neither do you live your spiritual life by any principle of uh, legalism. So anything that you add for salvation puts you further in debt on the one hand, and anything you add in spirituality besides the filling of the Spirit puts you adrift from grace, as we will note in a moment. So he says, so now I repeat these things, that you will be in bondage even today. So listen, I, Paul, tell you over and over that you let your, that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no benefit to you at all. Now we don't have that type of idea today. If people are circumcised or not, people don't make an issue out of it much at all, especially in terms of salvation or in terms of spirituality. But we have different forms of it today. What are the different forms? I repeat. I've given you these things before, but I repeat, just in case you weren't listening. For example, repent and believe. Most people think that repent means to feel sorry for your sins. As we've noted, metanoia'o means to simply change your mind about Christ and believe. So we have repent and believe. That is, feel sorry for what you've done and believe and you'll be saved. It's the same as adding circumcision to faith alone and Christ alone. Or confess your sins before salvation. You don't confess your sins before salvation. You confess your sins after salvation. Why? When you believe in Christ, all your your pre-salvation sins are forgiven. Or if you beg God to save you, it's the same as being circumcised. God has given us the premise of salvation. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Acts 16.31a Inviting Christ into your heart is another one that's been an addition. I tell you right now, I give you, as I've given it to you many times, the um, I've told you, go ahead, look in the Bible and tell me where it says invite, your, invite Christ into your heart and you'll be saved. You won't find it there. You can read it over about seven times. You'll never find it there. It's not there. Invite, your Christ, invite Christ into your heart and be saved is not even found in the Bible, but people have made it up as a human addition as part of a new law, a satanic law, because people are confused. And if you invite Christ into your heart, you're not saved. How are you saved? Acts 16.31a. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's how you're saved. That's what the Bible says. And I teach what the Bible says and I will not go on any human addition. 
or they will say you need to acknowledge Christ publicly for salvation or spirituality or you'll have to go through a which will work either for salvation or spirituality or as they said in Galatia you have to be circumcised for spirituality or salvation or one of the big ones today is you have to be baptized for salvation that has never been part of the equation ever baptism was a teaching tool to show people that they are identified with the death see you go in the water death, burial and resurrection up out of the water you're identified with Jesus Christ in resurrection it was a teaching tool so you believed in Christ and then after you believed in Christ they would go through the ritual of baptism just to show you exactly the means of your salvation you're not saved by coming forward by the fact that you have two legs and can walk forward doesn't mean you're saved you're saved by faith alone in Christ alone some people don't have legs and can't come forward or you're not saved by raising your hand. How are you saved? Faith alone in Christ alone. Raising your hand does not impress God. If I did this, do you think God's impressed? No. What is God impressed with? The work of Jesus Christ on the cross. You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. And He's not impressed with this either in post-salvation spirituality either. Waving your hands in the air toward God, thinking God looks down and smiles upon you. Do you know His Word? That's the question. You're waving at God, but do you know His Word? Or walking down the aisle. Walking down the aisle means nothing in terms of salvation or spirituality. Giving a public testimony about Christ. Now it's fine to give a public testimony if you know what you're talking about. If you get up and say, I believed in Jesus Christ and was saved, and you need to believe in Jesus Christ for that same salvation, that would be a wonderful public testimony. But it does not add to your spirituality, nor does it add to the fact that you're saved. And some people even go so far as to say you need to join a church to be saved. No, you don't. It's faith alone in Christ alone. Or that you have to give tithes and offerings to a church to be saved. No, you don't. It's faith alone in Christ alone. Or that you have to be spiritual by giving tithes and offerings. Or that you will be blessed by giving tithes and offerings. No, you won't. I can't imagine how many times I've been almost uh, about to vomit going up and down the streets of Anderson looking at church signs that say the sincerity of your heart means that you're going to tithe. If you really love the Lord, you'll tithe. Tithing was a part of the Old Testament income tax. We've noted that in the past, and we don't have to go over it again, although repetition's good, or that you have to keep the Mosaic Law, or that you have to do penance, or that you have to use the Lordship of Christ, or that you have to give up something to be saved, or that you have to maintain a healthy body to be saved. The Apostle Paul was rarely healthy, yet he was the greatest believer of all times or that you have to have salvation by morality or salvation by personality change or salvation by emotion or salvation by speaking in tongues or spirituality by speaking in tongues or salvation by feeling saved or spirituality by feeling spiritual or salvation through weeping tears at an altar or commitment salvation or lordship salvation all these things are addition and they're not found in the Bible and if you think they are I ask you to go look for it and bring me a verse and I won't be mad at you and I won't be mean with you. You just bring me the verse and I'll explain it to you and I'll show you once again how salvation is faith alone in Christ alone. And there's nothing to be added to it. Now in Galatians 5.3. Galatians 5.3 For I keep witnessing again. Now this is repetition from the Apostle Paul. For I keep witnessing again to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is a debtor to obey the whole law. For I keep witnessing again to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is a debtor to obey the whole law. Now what does this mean? Well this means that these people were trying to be circumcised for spirituality. What does it mean today? Nothing because most people get circumcised for health reasons at birth. Most people. So before I keep witnessing again, most men. And the funny thing is, where are the women in all this? Well, they didn't even think about women. They thought of women as cattle, but women were saved too. 
<laughs> it's really weird how people thought. But it's really weird how people think today too. For I keep witnessing again to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is a debtor to obey the whole law. That is, they were getting circumcised for the purpose of salvation or spirituality. So when they went into circumcision, the emphasis is that you are now in slavery. And at various points of time, the law will have you doing things and not doing things that will prove to you that you're in slavery. And once you get under legalism, there will be people that say, well, you've done this, but now you need to do this and that. And then once you do this and that, they'll say, well, now you need to do this, that, and the other. And you'll keep getting deeper and deeper into debt, whether it be by salvation or whether it be for spirituality. So instead of standing fast in the freedom, what happens is believers do different things here and there because their master is the law and not the Lord Jesus Christ. They make their master the law. And in fact today they make their master some pastor who tells them how to act and what to do. Or they make it some Sunday school teacher who tells them how to act and what to do and how to live. And that is not the means of your spirituality. So their master becomes a law. Their master becomes a taboo. And their master is not the Lord. And as James 2.10 says, if you offend in one point the law, you're guilty of all. It's like uh, breaking glass. If you throw a brick at glass, what happens? It doesn't just break at one point. It shatters all the bits. If you break one point of the law, the whole law shatters and you can't stand on it anymore. What must you stand on grace? Now in Galatians 5.4 You legalistic Jews that's actually who it's referring to you who are trying to be declared righteous by means of the law have been made completely non-operational from Christ. That means they have no spiritual life. They are loser believers. Then it goes on to say you have drifted off course from grace. Now I don't really know what it says in the English Bible, I think it might say you have fallen away from grace. No, you haven't. You can't fall away from grace. Grace is with you no matter how you act after you're saved. It means you've drifted off course. Oh, you're still under grace, but you've drifted off course. It's like being on a boat in the middle of Lake Hartwell in the middle of a storm and you're bouncing around on waves and you don't have a GPS, a grace positioning satellite. And that's what you need, a grace positioning satellite to keep you on course. And what gives you a grace positioning satellite? Doctrine, doctrine, doctrine. Doctrine brings grace. And this is what we have. In the ten problem solving devices, it's going to be hard for you to see, but there might be a card for you to look at. Rebound, of course, name your sins to God, then you're filled with the Spirit, then you have the faith rest real, and then we have grace and doctrinal orientation. They work in tandem. Now, where are you going to learn grace? From doctrine. And the more you learn about the Word of God, the more you learn how to be gracious. And they work in tandem. So what is your GPS, grace positional satellite? Your interest in the Word of God. That's where it is. Your interest in the Word of God. Finally, some people started waking up. Just a few. Grace positional satellite. Doctrinal orientation. Keeps you oriented to grace as well. So you know where you are. But instead, most people have drifted, on, have drifted off course from grace. And they're out there floating around in Georgia somewhere and they don't even know where they are. And they want to get back to South Carolina, but they can't because their GPS isn't working grace positional satellite and so then uh, the children get mad and everything else I want to go home now I don't know where I am I've drifted off course well drift off course from grace is what it means you've drifted off course from grace not on Lake Hartwell but right here in your own soul drifted off course from grace and have gone into legalism meaning you have no grace orientation Therefore, you're non-operational. And that means you have no power. 
You have no power of the filling of the Holy Spirit and it also means you have no power in terms of being the salt of the land. And if ever we need salt of the land or a remnant, it's right now in this country. Our country's in trouble. We're teetering. We are being held together by a thread of a slim, major, a slim minority of believers who have grown in grace and in knowledge and it's getting thinner every day. And it's up to you. You have a chance right now to become part of that thread and to become part of the remnant of mature believers to help this country out of a very bad situation. And the only reason the situation is bad is because so many believers have gone in for legalism. They've gone in for slavery. And if you as a believer go in for slavery in your soul, your nation will go in for slavery in the human freedom as well. Who is to blame for the fact that we're losing most of our freedom? Not the lascivious crowd. Not the crowd raising hell. The crowd who is going in for legalism. Their whole thinking has become part of slavery. And therefore, when they come up with certain laws, you agree with them. You say, that's true. There should be no bars. There should be no liquor stores. There should be no cigarette shops. That's right, I agree with it. And guess what? They'll take away that freedom because you're under slavery and you want freedom to be taken away. And then eventually they'll take away a freedom that you love. And that's the way this country is going. And the greatest hindrance to freedom in a nation is legalism. And it is not... Now, those people raising hell aren't helping, but they're not doing any more harm than you are as a legalist. Not that you are. I'm talking in general. So Galatians 5.4, You who are trying to be declared righteous by means of the law have been made completely non-operational from Christ. You're, you are not spiritual. You have drifted off course from grace. Now in Galatians 5.5. 5. And here we have the hope of the believer. Or the confidence. Elpis, the absolute confidence of the believer. We, through the Spirit, by our faith rest, are waiting for the confident expectation of righteousness. What does that mean? We, that is believers, through what? The filling of the Spirit. You must be filled with the Spirit. And again, how are you filled with the Spirit? You name your sin to God or sins and then you're filled with the Spirit. And then you are spiritual. So while you are filled with the Spirit, then you can use what is called faith rest by faith. Having the faith rest real. Leaving your problems in the Lord's hands. Don't complain about your problems. Leave them in God's hands. He'll take care of your problems. And you can only do that with the filling of the Spirit. That gives you the power to leave it in God's hands. That gives you the power not to worry about it. Because as soon as you have worry, you hop right back into slavery. Slavery of the old sin nature. You don't need to worry about anything. God has everything under control. Do you believe it? Well, you have to be filled with the Spirit, and then if you believe it, that's part of the faith rest drill. So we, through the Spirit and by faith rest, are waiting for the confident expectation. That's Elpis. The confident expectation of righteousness, that's the kind of Sune capacity righteousness. This is actually referring to eternal capacity, and what it's actually referring to is the fact that when you get to heaven, if you've lived this spiritual life, and when the resurrection occurs, you will go through Bema, and from that you will expect, you will have such confidence in your spiritual life that you will expect eternal reward. Do you have that confidence today? Do you have that confidence today that if the resurrection were to occur tonight at 9 o'clock, that you would get to heaven and expect reward from Jesus Christ? Do you? Probably not. You might think it's a bit presumptuous to say so. But it's not if you have this confident expectation from the doctrine you know. And you will expect to receive blessing. You will expect to receive the crown of righteousness, the crown of glory. You will expect to receive all these eternal rewards because you lived your spiritual life and it all goes to glorify Jesus Christ anyway. So it really isn't 
presumptuous because every reward you receive goes straight to the glory of Jesus Christ. So we need to evaluate ourselves in our own thinking. So this is in Galatians 5.5 5, it's talking about what is technically known as experiential sanctification. It is having a confident expectation of eternal rewards. And you will receive no eternal rewards if you're in legalism. That means that 99.9% .9 of most of the believers around this country will receive no rewards. Why? They've gone in for the law or they've gone in for taboos. And they're doing this and that for salvation and they're doing this and that for spirituality when they need to be living their unique spiritual life and they're not even close to it. They don't even know what it is. And why don't they know what it is? Because they don't want to know. They don't give a flying you-know-what. They just don't care. Do you care? You should. Your eternal status depends on it. Now all of you here are saved. I'll see you all in heaven, maybe. Well, I know you'll all be in heaven, but whether I see you or not might, be turned upon, might depend upon our echelon. If we all die before the resurrection, I'll see you in heaven. But if we all are resurrected now, and I get my rewards and you get yours, we might go to different parts of heaven. And I might be down in the lower echelon, which would be shocking, but oh well. I might be down in the lower echelon and you might be way up here. And God said, you lived your spiritual life. And so you get to go live over here and eat from the tree of life and I might never see you. There are different uh, areas of heaven and you are distinguished in heaven. You will get to see your loved ones though. That is part of scripture. So I guess you'll get to see them even though you are high echelon or low echelon. You will get to see your mother, father, and all those who have gone on before. So we, through the Spirit, by faith rest, are waiting for the confident expectation of righteousness. Now these Galatians have not gone far enough to understand three things, and that's faith, hope, and love. And we hear it in country songs. They don't know what they're saying, but faith, hope, and love. Faith, hope, and love. What is faith, hope, and love? And what happened to my pointer? There it is. I knocked it off. Faith, hope, and love. Well, here's faith. Faith rest drill. And uh, this is what you must begin to have in terms of growing in grace and knowledge. First of all, you must be filled with the Spirit. Then you must have faith. The faith rest drill. Where does hope begin? You see, this is childhood. And you begin with the faith rest drill. Where does hope begin? Number six, a personal sense of destiny. That's hope. And where is love? The tandem, impersonal or personal love for God the Father and impersonal love for mankind. That's the adult stage. So what it's referring to here, faith, hope, and love, is you start out with the faith rest drill. You end up with confidence. And then you end up with love, meaning personal love for God. Where does true love begin? You've got to love God first before you can ever, ever begin to love man. You'll never understand what love for man is or impersonal love is until you love God first. And you'll never have good relationships with people until you love God first. You might have a rosy idea about uh, marriage, especially if you're young, especially if you're a young lady. You might have your own hope chest and you might have all these things about well, my husband's going to be tall. That's usually the one they like. Tall, he's going to be handsome, he's going to have probably dark hair. That used to be it. Maybe blonde, they don't care anymore. Maybe now it's blonde hair, blue eye, tall and handsome. And that's what you want. And that's part of your hope chest. And you think that's how it's going to be. And maybe you will run across it's inevitable. There's a lot of people out there. You'll probably run across somebody you think who's very, very handsome. And maybe they don't give a whit about their spiritual life. And you think you're going to snub your nose at God and say, you know what, he don't care about the spiritual life, which shows you don't really. And I'm just going to go with this man anyway. You'll end up divorced with that handsome man faster than you would with any ugly weirdo. It's just it's just no difference in terms of looks. You may, look at all the people in Hollywood. They're the most beautiful people in the world, and they are. I'll admit that. 
People in Hollywood are absolutely handsome and the women are gorgeous and the men are usually handsome. And guess what? They're popping out babies left and right and then hopping from uh, marriage to marriage. Marriage to marriage. Now why did they do that? You would think they would be absolutely happy. They've got all the money in the world, don't they? Yes, they do. And they've got the most beautiful woman and the most beautiful woman married to the most beautiful man and then they get divorced with all the money in the world. Why? Those things don't mean happiness. Where do you as a believer get happiness? From the Word of God. And that's where you will learn where your right man is or your right woman. If you go into legalism, you'll marry somebody who's a witch. And if you go into lasciviousness, uh, you won't make it at all. Either way, you won't make it. But with the spiritual life, you will. And you say, but there's nobody around you who really cares about what you're teaching. <laughs> Obviously not. But so what? You think that limits God in bringing you somebody? No. God is not limited. God is never limited. I lived in Spartanburg where it was just me and my family listening to the Word of God on a daily basis. And oftentimes I listened way more than that, but I'm not going to brag to you. And guess what? I still got married from no, nobody around here, from just somebody from Houston, Texas. So God brings the right person at the right time. And if you're a man, God will bring that woman to you. And if you're a woman, you'll be led to your right man. And do you think God is limited in that? Well, I have to go to a church where there are young people so that I can marry somebody or that I can get to know somebody and eventually marry them. You'll get to know somebody and marry somebody who knows nothing about the Word and you'll be miserable because you've learned something about it. And you're going to see them in a different light. I hope you will. I hope you've learned something. And you'll probably see them in a different light than you would have ever seen them before. And it's going to be difficult. It's very difficult to live with someone who has different spiritual values than you. Very difficult. Almost impossible except that the person in spiritual maturity can hold it together. And do you want to live a life of misery? Or do you want to live a life of happiness? You stick with the Word of God and let God deal with the timing. Look at Joseph. He was 40 years old before he married. And some of you would never wait that long. Too impatient. But when it comes to the Word of God, you've got to be patient. Grow in grace and knowledge. God will provide. And then you'll miss out on all that rancor and all that. And then you'll marry a right woman at age 40. Wait on the Lord. Be patient. And in marriage, if you're not patient, if you don't wait on the Lord, you're going to screw up and you're going to screw up big. And I tell you this as a warning. Once I get ordained, I'll be able to marry some people, I guess. And uh, I'm not going to say anything to them because you can't... You see, what happens is when uh, there's a minister, the parents might get upset and say, I really don't want her marrying this man. You know what the minister has to say? They want to get married. I don't want them living together, so... Uh, they might as well get married because they're not going to listen to you anyway and they're not going to listen to me. So go ahead and do the ceremony and then let the war begin. So Galatians 5.6. I got way off subject, but Galatians 5.6. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision, uncircumcision carries any weight. Same goes with all the other works. The only thing that matters is Bible doctrine working through love. And again, we've studied that. And the Apostle Paul is actually throwing out some advanced doctrine to the Galatians. Which means he had taught them up to a point. Which means he had told them these things before. He had taught them about love. I won't show it. But he had taught them about love and how it's personal love for God and impersonal love for mankind. The very fact that he mentions it means he's taught them about it. But now they've gone in for legalism. After they've heard all of that phenomenal doctrine, they'd rather go in for legalism. It is absolutely weird. But that's the way people go and the Apostle Paul himself will go in that direction for a moment. Galatians 
five seven. You were running commend uh, commendably. You were running commendably. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? Now what the Apostle Paul is doing here is using running. Now in the ancient world, running track was a very interesting sport and they used it quite a bit, just as they do today. It's come back into popularity today. Every time there's prosperity, sports come back into popularity. And so we're prosperous as a nation, so sports have, and so has running track. So actually what Paul is talking about is running track. And what he's really referring to in terms of history is that when you run track, sometimes you're running right along and you're pacing yourself, especially in a marathon, but then somebody comes along and kicks you, you know, kicks your leg. And guess what? It takes you off stride, and being off stride for just a little bit can hinder your whole race. And so this is what Paul is actually referring to. He's saying you were running a good race. Now you let these legalists come along and kick you off stride, throw their foot in front of you, and now you're stumbling all over yourself. You started out in grace. You were running good in grace. A legalist came down and said, this is not what you need. What you need is this. What you need is to follow the law. What you need to do is to get circumcised. What you need to do is this, that, and the other. And so these people stumbled. The Galatians stumbled. So who, hurt, who hindered you from obeying the truth? What this means is their stride was broken by a many. Their stride was broken by legalists. And disobedience to doctrine of God's word means a broken stride. If you're disobedient to the word of God, it means a broken stride. I want to tell you something. If you're disobedient to the things that are coming out of Galatians, you're in trouble. You're in serious trouble because Paul is slapping these people across the face in terms of verbally. And if you don't want to follow what Paul says, now you weren't here for the allegory. They have that just about. That was great for me. I just love the allegory. But in Galatians 4.30 again, Nevertheless, what does the Scripture say? Separate yourself from the slave woman and her son. Separate yourself from legalism. For the son of the slave woman, the son of legalism, will not share in the inheritance with the son. If you decide you, you don't want to do that, you think you hurt me? Absolutely not. It's not personal with me. You're hurting yourself. If you don't separate yourself from the slave woman, you'll become a slave. And you'll be in that legalism. And if you have one foot in a legalistic church and another foot in a grace church, you'll be doing the splits all the time and you'll never run forward. And I don't say that for my benefit. I say it for your benefit. Whatever your cho choice is, is your choice. But you need to wake up and realize that what we're studying here is not just a book. It is the Word of God which is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. And of course the sword splits between people. And you may have friends in legalism, but what does God's sword do? And why? Because He doesn't want you to be influenced, and He does it out of love so that you will not lose your crowns, so that you will not lose your inheritance. He doesn't do it just to keep you away from something. What keeps you in slavery is legalism, not the freedom of grace. And he doesn't say these things to keep you away from a social life. He tells you these things to keep you away from an apostasy, especially in this land, that is so pervasive that you'll never make it unless you get serious about the word. There is so much apostasy in this land, I'm surprised you're even here. There's wonderful things on television you could be watching. And on Sunday, there's wonderful churches you could go to for fellowship. That is, what they call human fellowship between people. Now in Galatians 5, 9. Well, let's see, I, I, I missed 5, 8 first. Galatians 5, 8. Their persuasion, and this is actually elliptical, and it says, This persuasion, not from the one who calls you, it's very elliptical, meaning there's no verb. Now, we put verbs in the English because that's how we flow our language. 
But you know, when you get mad at your children, sometimes you leave out verbs. And this is what Paul is doing, getting mad with his children, as it were, not really mad. But he says, this persuasion, not from the one who calls you. In other words, this circumcision, this adding to faith alone in Christ alone, this adding to spirituality, this is not from Jesus Christ. This is not from the one who has called you. Now in Galatians 5, 9, a little yeast makes the whole batch of dough rise. A little yeast makes the whole batch of dough rise. If you know anything about cooking, you know that's true. You just put a little yeast in some bread and you put it in the oven and it rises. And that means that when there is legalism, just a little bit of legalism in a church, it will spread throughout and it will rise and it will become a problem. And so that's why the Apostle Paul wrote Galatians to stamp it out once and for all. And this is why he's been so tough and so harsh. He didn't want to be. We even noted a verse where he said, I wish I could be face to face with you so that I didn't have to be so tough on you so that I could see if you were responding or not. But then he went on to say, but I'm suspicious of you that you are not responding to what I'm saying. So then he goes on, a little yeast makes the whole batch of dough rise. And a little yeast, you might go to a church and say, well, they do teach that you're saved if you believe. Well, good. But then you say, well, they don't teach rebound and they say you have to feel sorry for your sin. Well, actually, that's a lot of yeast, but you might consider it a little yeast, but whatever, it makes the whole dough rise. Avoid it. A little yeast makes the whole batch of dough rise, which means you cannot compromise with legalism. Just a little bit of legalism makes the whole thing a mess, and there will be fighting, and there will be squabbling, and there will be strife, and there will be church splits, and there will be everything else because of legalism. And is that how Christians are to act? What are You know, most churches around here are splitting apart after just one year. Is that Christian? And they always talk about what is Christian. You can't be a Christian and do that. What are you doing splitting up a church? What are you doing being in strife? What are you doing in the old sin nature? And actually the Apostle Paul is going to get into this later. And this is what we will note. But what, what, what we must understand right now is that we must avoid legalism as Galatians 4.30 said. And I didn't get as far as I wanted, but that's okay. I have a lot of time left, I hope. And uh, so we will continue with these studies tomorrow and Sunday. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, I thank you. Uh, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of assembling ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us as to what actually grace is and to what legalism is and how we should separate ourselves and in order that we might be filled with the Spirit and live our own spiritual lives as unto you. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.